Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, I will call into open session this meeting of the Arlington ISD Board of Trustees on June 21st, 2018, beginning at 7.15 p.m. Hope everybody's enjoying uh, uh, summertime and our wonderful Texas temperatures that we're all experiencing right now. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we will start our meeting with the opening ceremony. Please join Dr. Cavazos in leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> And now if you would uh, please silence uh, cell phones and any electronic devices uh, that you may have to avoid disruptions to those around you. And if you would also please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, my mic just keeps going off on me. All right, so the uh, first item on our agenda this evening. Uh, under <laughs> okay. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Somebody's playing with me here. <laughs> First on our agenda under program and presentation is the uh, Student Leadership Advisory Board. And uh, we have a, uh, a great group of students here uh, that are part of our, our new cohort of, of advisory board. Uh, before I go further, uh, Ms. Hollinger, would you mind uh, coming and explaining and introducing? Thank you. Thank you, President Reich, Dr. Cavazos, and members of the board. I'd like to introduce to you all this evening our new group of members for our Student Leadership Advisory Board. And they consist of our junior class presidents from our traditional high schools as well as our collegiate high school. Their purpose of being on this committee um, is started in 2012, I believe, and it was a part of our strategic plan. And that was included as a part of building relationships with our board members in regards to our high school students and having that collaboration and also having the voices heard from our students. And tonight, throughout the year also, let me not forget that the importance of the meetings that they have, that they come and meet with you all. They're assigned to each one of you. One of you gets uh, a member that they get to um, participate with throughout the year at our meetings here in our planning sessions, as well as serve on committees Throughout the um, district, they do not get to vote on these committees. However, they do get to provide insight about what is going on at the campuses and some of the activities and, and insight for you all when you're making decisions across the district. So in regards to our group this evening, I'd like to introduce our president that is a senior at Arlington High School, and that is Julia Almaraz, and she's going to come on up. <laughs> Hello. Um, i just like to say thank you for this opportunity. I served last year and it was a blast. I loved every second of it. Um, and I'm just going to introduce the new SLAB members. Uh, so from Arlington Collegiate, there's Alamaris Hernandez. Uh, there's from Arlington High School. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> um, from Bowie, there's Michelle Tong, who is not here today. Um, from Lamar, there is Mia Palladini. From Martin, there is Matt Franco. From Sam Houston, there is Brad Flick. And from Seguin, there is Jackie Rogers. So I look forward to working with them this year, and we're going to have a good time. Wonderful. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of our uh, Student Leadership Advisory Board. We. Uh, we are looking very forward to uh, 
uh, working with you, learning from you, you learning from us, and, and moving forward through this year. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, can't wait to... Hmm? Yes, I uh, can't, can't wait to uh, get together with you more, and uh, we're gonna, going to continue on uh, with, with our agenda. You're more than welcome to stay if you like, or you can go enjoy our Texas heat out there a little bit, so uh, just so you know. Uh, so thank you again, and thank you, Ms. Hollinger, for uh, uh, the introductions. So moving on on our agenda is uh, appointments. Uh, we have the consideration for the ratification of administrative appointments. Uh, for Associate Principal Sam Houston High, Assistant Principal of Lamar, Assistant Principal Sherrod, Assistant Principal South Davis, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Rice, and a uh, slight adjustment on that, we will not be bringing uh, Sherrod AP today. Oh, okay. But I would like to recommend the board ratify the appointment of the individuals discussed in closed session for Principal for Short Elementary, Associate Principal for Sam Houston High School, Assistant Principal for Lamar uh, High School, and Assistant Principal for South Davis as discussed in closed session. Mr. Hibbs. Uh, thank you, President Reich. I, I move that we accept the administrative appointments. And I second. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Hibbs, a second by Mr. Chapa. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. All right. Congratulations. All trustees vote in the affirmative. Thank you, President Rice. And I'd like to introduce the principal for a short elementary, Ms. Katina Martinez. <laughs> Katina attended the University of Texas at Arlington for a Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, UT Arlington for a Master of Ed in Ed Leadership or Leadership Policy Studies. Most recently, a principal in uh, Kennedale ISD in Delaney Elementary School has served as an interim principal, an assistant principal, a sixth grade math and science teacher, and a third grade teacher, and a fifth grade teacher. Katina, congratulations and welcome. Thank you. President Reich, Dr. Cavazos, and members of the board, I come before you tonight to thank you for the opportunity to serve as the new principal at Short Elementary. I am both excited and honored to start my new administrative journey in such a well-respected district. I would like to thank Dr. Christy Buell for seeing something in me that made her confident in my ability to be the next leader of Short Elementary. My promise to each of you is to work tirelessly for the students, parents, faculty, and community of Short Elementary. As you get to know me a little better, you will quickly see that I am a dedicated principal that cherishes every moment with my students and staff. I did not get to this place in my professional career without the help of many people who lend their support in making me better every day. I would first like to thank my husband, Dion, for all his love, support, and total belief in me. The life of a principal is not always easy, and I thank him for always knowing when I have needed him to encourage me, to help me, or just to listen to me. To my daughter, Megan, who is here tonight, and to my son, Jordan, who was unable to be here, I hope they know that everything I have ever done, both personally and professionally, has been to become the best mother and role model that they could be proud of. To my parents, their unwavering love and support has taught me many things during my life. I owe my solid work ethic and the ability to persevere through life's challenges to both of them. They have always been so proud of all of my accomplishments and tonight is no different. And lastly, I have a special group of family and friends that are here tonight to celebrate every, this very special moment with me Without each of these special people, I would not be the person that I am today. They've always encouraged me, supported me, cheered me on, and made me laugh when times were a little bumpy. I will forever be grateful that they, each of them came into my life. And thank you again for this opportunity, and know that I'm very excited to be the next principal of Short Elementary. Thank you. Next I'd, like to, next, I'd like to introduce the new associate principal for Sam Houston High School, Ms. Rosa Orozco. <laughs> Rosa attended the University of Texas at Arlington, Bachelor of Arts in Communication, University of Texas at Arlington for Master of Ed in Leadership Policy Studies and Dual Language. 
Most recently, the principal of Spear Elementary has been an interim principal, an assistant principal at Lamar, an assistant principal at Carter, a seventh grade uh, math teacher at Shackelford, and a seventh grade ESL teacher at Shackelford. Rosa, congratulations. Thank you. President Reich, Superintendent Dr. Cavazos, and members of the board, I am honored to be appointed as associate principal at Sam Houston High School. I would like to thank Area Superintendent Tracy Brown, Principal Benavides, and the interviewing committee for selecting me for this position. I am 100% committed to the work that we do here in the district, and I look forward to working with everyone at SAM to ensure that all of our students are graduating college and career ready. I would also like to thank the area superintendents who have helped me along the way at Spear Elementary, Dr. Buell, Mrs. Wilma Sonato, and most recently, Dr. Jarko. Thank you for taking the time to invest in me and further my leadership development. To my Spear family, I will miss you dearly, and I encourage you to continue the work that we've begun. I also want to thank everyone who has mentored me along the way, Mr. Hagman and Mr. Costa, who are here tonight. Thank you for your words of encouragement, your words of wisdom, and your support. I would not be here without you. Um, here with me tonight is my loving and supportive husband, Jeff, my mother-in-law, Kathy, and my dad, Jose Orozco. Te quiero mucho y agradezco todo lo que has hecho para mí. Gracias por todos los consejos y el apoyo que siempre me has dado. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce the assistant principal for Lamar uh, High School, Dr. Aaron Fogelman. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Fogelman attended West, West Virginia University to obtain her Bachelor of Arts in English Literature, UT Arlington for a Master of Ed in uh, Education Teaching, UT Arlington for a PhD in Ed Leadership and Policy Studies. Most recently has been the AVID coordinator and teacher at Lamar High School has been an AVID coordinator and teacher at Gunn Junior High, eighth grade uh, English teacher, and a seventh grade writing teacher as well. Dr. Fogelman, congratulations. Thank you. President Reich, members of the board, and Dr. Gavassos, thank you for allowing me this extraordinary opportunity to positively impact and serve the entire community of Lamar High School. I walk this journey with an open heart and a determination to strengthen student self-efficacy as well as support teachers in their quest to enrich the lives of kids. Thank you, Mr. Hagman, and my entire Lamar family that's here. I don't know if you see all that blue and gold back there. Um, uh, and my countless mentors for their support that they've given me. Finally, life would not be the same without dearest friends and family. Thank you, Mom and Rose, for being here tonight, as well as my Louisiana family watching at home. Um, thank you for sharing in this unimaginable moment with me. Go Vikes. Last but not least, we'd like to introduce the assistant principal for South Davis Elementary, Heather Garcia. <laughs> Heather attended UT Arlington for a Bachelor of Arts in Education, Lamar University for a Master of Ed in Administration. Most recently, an administrative intern in Grand Prairie ISD, also an arts integration and video production specialist, has uh, taught third and fourth grade, and uh, also third grade in Irving. Uh, Heather, welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, President Reich, members of the board, and Dr. Cavazos, I'd like to first thank, um, thank you so much for this opportunity to serve the students and families of Arlington ISD. Um, thank you, Mr. Gutierrez and Ms. Hubner and the South Davis Elementary staff for taking a chance on me. I promise to work hard for you and our students each and every day. I'm so excited for the opportunity to return home to AISD after 19 years away. I'm finally back to where I fell in love with education in the first place. I plan to pass my love for learning on to every student I serve here in this great city. I'd like to thank my tribe of supporters, including my husband Marcos and my son Alex for the love and support you always have for me, as well as my parents, Danny and Nancy Helm, and my friend Maria Johnson. Thank you for being there for me every step of the way. I couldn't be more thrilled to return home and serve the next generation of Bulldogs, future Rams, and future Colts. Kick them. Congratulations. Can you hear me? Congratulations to each of you. Uh, we uh, 
we can tell by the the amount of individuals in the audience the uh, the, the the support and the excitement uh, for each of you for your respective schools. Uh, happy for you. Uh, look forward to uh, following you in 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 your next uh, stage in the journey here and, and the path and 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 serving our students so remarkably well. Uh, as is our custom, I'd ask each of you to follow Mr. Kale uh, to the lobby for a a welcome uh, and receiving line. Uh, our SLAB students, uh, since you're still here, if you like, you can also join them <laughs> so that everybody can say hello to you. So please follow uh, Mr. Kale if you like, or you can sneak out the door either way. <laughs> and to, and to the uh, audience, if you would uh, please indulge the board to go first so that we can come back in and uh, continue on with business. Uh, we'd appreciate that. At 7.31, we'll take a about a 10-minute recess. 7.41, we'll return. Thank you. All right, I will call back in uh, out of our recess uh, open session uh, tonight. The next item on our agenda is a public hearing, and it is on the 2018-19 budget and proposed tax rate. So I will officially open our public hearing uh, on the 2018-19 budget and proposed tax rate. I do not see any cards. Is that correct, Ms. Benjamin? There are no cards. Therefore, at this time, uh, I will call this public hearing closed. That was quick and easy. All right, moving on. Next, we come to the open forum for agenda items portion of our, our meeting. Uh, this is a routine part of the school board's agenda for regularly scheduled meetings. This segment of the meeting provides citizens an opportunity to share their views uh, with the trustees on items that are on the agenda uh, tonight. It's not intended to be a discussion or debate, uh, and trustees will not reply to the speakers. 
Uh, derogatory comments aimed at an individual are not tolerated, and personnel matters are not appropriate subjects for open forum. I do have one card uh, from the audience. Uh, when your name is called, please step forward to the podium. You will have five minutes to speak. A lighted timer on the podium will assist you in pacing your presentation. A yellow light will illuminate when there's one minute left uh, for you to complete your presentation. When the red light comes on and the buzzer sounds, uh, please end your presentation. So our one card this evening, uh, Laura Desat. Did I say it right? Oh, I was. Oh, that means no. <laughs> and you are uh, speaking on uh, related to uh, DH Local uh, tonight, uh, representing Moms Demand Action, uh, Be Smart program in School Marshal. Go right ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Cavazos, Dr. Reich, and the rest of the school board. Thank you very much for having me this evening. I wanted to first start off by thanking the school board for your time tonight. I'm Laura Dosat the mother of a second grader and fourth grader at Hill Elementary. My husband is a teacher in Mansfield ISD and I'm a product of AISD. I attended Wood, Corey, Bowles and I'm a graduate of Martin High School. I'm here because I believe in public schools as I know you all do. I'm also here because I want to do everything in my power to support a safe environment for my kids, their teachers, their friends and the entire community. I have previously reached out to some of you and have heard from you. I appreciate your time and your responses and hope to share my thoughts and concerns with the rest of the board tonight. As you probably know, in response to the horrific school shooting in Santa Fe, Texas, Governor Abbott released his School and Firearm Safety Action Plan for Texas school districts. This plan includes a recommendation for the expansion of the school marshal program, which allows teachers or other staff to carry guns inside schools. When I first read the details of this plan, it made me sick to my stomach. For the safety of our students and educators, we urge AISD not to adopt or expand the school marshal or program nor the guardian plan. Guns do not belong in schools, which are meant to be places of sanctuary, safety, and learning for children. The presence of guns at school adds an unpredictable element that puts educators and students at an increased risk and even layers more safety concerns on top of the heavy responsibilities they already carry. There is no evidence that arming the teachers will make schools safer. Arming civilians is not an effective way to stop active shooters. Law enforcement officers are extensively trained to handle the chaos and dynamics of an actor shooter situation. Civilians are not. Out of the 160 active shooter incidents, the FBI found only one successful armed civilian intervention, and that, was, that civilian was a trained U.S. Marine. The notion that a teacher with 12 hours of training would hit an active shooter is unrealistic, and there is a risk of unintended injuries to students and staff during an active shooter situation and during ordinary school time. The American Federation of Teachers the National Education Association, the National Association of School Resource Officers, and the Major Cities Chiefs Association have expressed opposition to arming teachers. Liability insurers also recognize the increased risk and sometimes refuse coverage or raise premiums for schools that allow employees to carry guns. Instead of bringing more guns to our campus, we need to ensure we are bringing less. Often guns wind up at school because a child has access to guns owned by parents or other family members, which we have tragically seen recently. There are programs available such as Be Smart campaign, which I've emailed some of you about previously, which was created to reduce shootings and suicides that occur when children get a hold of unsecured firearms. The Be Smart Safe Gun Storage Program is one solution we could promote at our district to increase safety in our schools. This program could be piloted at schools and provide an education to our parents and families of how to keep their children safe. Whatever we do, we can't let the narrative of the solution to school safety shift to arming teachers. Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And that is the only weapon that needs to be in the hands of our teachers in Arlington. This is a big problem, but I know by working together, we can all be part of the solution. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we will move on uh, next on our agenda, our action items. The first one is uh, to consider the authoriz authorizing the use of surplus general fund balance and approving uh, an earnest money contract and resolution authorizing the purchase of two tracks uh, described as uh, stated on our agenda this evening. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Rice, and uh, that, that is correct. That is our recommendation. Thank you. Uh, this is an action item. Uh, Mr. Hibbs. 
Thank you, President Rice. I move the, uh, to approve authorizing the use of surplus general fund balance and approving an earnest money contract and resolution authorizing the purchase of two tracts of real property as recommended by the administration. All right, I have a motion. I second the motion, uh, uh, President Rice. Second by Ms. Walton to uh, approve the authorization as stated on the agenda. Any discussion? Okay. Mr. Hogg, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Ms. Powell, real quick question on, on how we're funding this. I know when we buy, when we sell land, we must allocate that money back towards land. Right. Um, are we utilizing that in this case, or do we have any of that um, allocation to be able to utilize that? For the, the purchase of the land, we are uh, not bound to go back to a particular fund source for that. So we have identified that we have funds available in the general fund that we can use for this. And there's no money that we've sold from anything in the past that's earmarked or anything like that that we can't allocate? No. Okay. That's fine. That we have available at this time. Just need to check. I know we get limited sometimes, especially if you bought something from bond money. Right. You have to use it for those type of things. Right. So that's, that's what I'm double checking on. Okay. Thank you. Very good. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, no uh, additional trustees uh, with questions or discussion. So please vote. Motion passes 100%. Uh, Moving on, uh, the next item, action item B is to consider all matters uh, incident and related to the issuance and sales of the Arlington ISD Unlimited Tax School Building Bond Series 2018, including the adoption of an order authorizing the issuance of such bonds and approving all other matters pertaining thereto. Dr. Kvassos. Thank you, President Rice. And the board heard a presentation uh, from our uh, consultants uh, at dinner. And so we recommend uh, the issuance of this. Uh, thank you very much. This is an action item, Mr. Hibbs. Thank you, President Reich. Uh, big day in Arlington because we were finally allocating the uh, final part of the uh, bond money uh, uh, for the uh, 2014 bond. Um, with that, I move to approve the, adop the adoption of an order of authorizing the issuance of uh, sale of the Arlington Independent School uh, District Unlimited Tax School Building Bond Series 2018 and approving all other matters pertaining thereto. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Mrs. Mays has a second on that motion. Any discussion by trustees? Seeing none, please vote. Motion carries 100%. Moving on, uh, action item C, consider the uh, approval delegating parameter authority to the superintendent and chief financial officer for, for procurement of electricity supply services, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Rice, and we uh, ask for your consideration, the board's consideration to approve this uh, delegating authority uh, to get the best uh, pricing on electricity. This is an action item. Any trustees uh, have uh, a motion I'm willing to entertain? All right, Ms. Walton. Uh, I move that we approve the delegating of, param uh, of authority to the superintendent and CFO for procurement of electricity supply services. Second. Motion by Ms. Walton, second by Mr. Hogg uh, to approve the uh, delegating the uh, parameter authority to the superintendent and CFO for procurement of electricity services. Any discussion by trustees? Seeing none, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. <coughs> All right, moving on. Uh, next on our agenda is the discussion action portion. Uh, and we have one item uh, for discussion action. Uh, consider the adoption of the 2018-19 fiscal year budget. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Rice. And the board has heard several presentations uh, on our budget and has uh, actually uh, voted on parts of that, uh, significant parts of that budget. Tonight, we bring uh, an overview of that and, uh, and recommend approval of, of the budget. So Ms. Powell. 
Professor Rice, board members, Dr. Cavazos, uh, we have uh, had two lengthy discussions on our budget for the 18-19 year, and the board has already taken action on several key items and directed staff to build those items into the budget. Uh, so what you're going to see this evening is a pretty succinct presentation of the results of those uh, those, those actions, and then uh, uh, we'll seek uh, approval for the budget. Uh, so this uh, this calendar again shows our timeline. Uh, tonight uh, we held a public hearing. There were no speakers uh, on the proposed budget and tax rate. Uh, we'll take a final pass at the budget and then ask you all to consider adopting it. By law, we have to have it adopted by June 30th uh, because our fiscal year does begin on, on July 1st. We are not adopting a tax rate tonight. Uh, the tax rate is adopted in August after we get our certified values from the Tarrant Appraisal District. So. Uh, Looking at the general fund, uh, just remind us all of some of the highlights there. Uh, the revenues are, um, are estimated based on our projection that property values will be a little over 7% higher than they were last year once we get the certified values, and that um, we will tax at the tax rate, uh, M&O tax rate of $1.04, which again is the same rate uh, we assessed last year. Uh, in terms of state aid, uh, we are using current law. There was no additional money allocated by the legislature that would kick in for this upcoming year. Uh, and enrollment, uh, which uh, helps determine our state aid, uh, is estimated at 60,269 students, uh, which is a decrease of a little over 800 students from last year. On the expenditure side, our expenditure budget aligns with our strategic plan. Uh, we staff at, um, with staffing ratios that the board approved in, uh, in January, I believe it was, and we use those enrollment projections uh, to help us determine staffing needs. So again, the, the enrollment projection is a key part of this. The board uh, took action uh, at um, the first meeting in June uh, to approve new positions. We built those into the budget. Uh, there were 21 of them. Uh, when we net that against the changes that took place at the campus level staffing meetings, we wind up with a net uh, decrease of eight positions overall from last year. Uh, included in the mix though are new dyslexia teachers, new gifted and talented teachers, and new FLESS teachers, along with those 21 support positions that the district, uh, that the board has already approved. The board also took action at last week's meeting to approve a two and a quarter percent um, raise for all eligible employees, and that will be calculated on base pay. And uh, the board also gave direction to staff and approved uh, a $240 increase in the annual contribution towards employee health insurance. That will apply to people who are taking our health insurance who are also members of the district's wellness plan. And then finally, the, the other big thing we always talk about with our budget is fund balance. Uh, with the budget that we have adopted, and we'll look at it on the next screen, um, our total fund balance will be just over $153 million. The unassigned portion of that, which is the portion that our credit rating agencies look at and, and basically rate us on, is uh, uh, budgeted to be $149.8 million. That equals approximately 3.4 months worth of operating expenses. Credit rating agencies want to see that we have at least two months of operating expenses. So here's a, a brief summary of our budget. Um, with your packets, um, you have a much more detailed presentation of the budget. Uh, the budget document itself, if you look on page one, uh, has the budget for all funds summarized on a single page at the functional level. That's the level at which you will actually be asked to adopt the budget. Uh, by law, the, uh, the board sets the budget at the functional level. So uh, as the budget stands, the proposed budget, um, we have $491.7 million in general fund revenues, and we have expenditures of $530 million. So the budget that you'll be considering this evening has a deficit of $38.7 million. And again, you can see at the very bottom of the slide um, that uh, the fund balance uh, is now budgeted to be $153.1 million. 
This uh, graph shows um, where our, our fund balance is, uh, a history of fund balance, and uh, the number of months of operating expense in the unassigned portion of fund balance. That 3.39 uh, that number that you see with the blue line across the top is our number of months of operating expense. So uh, I think one thing I would point out on our budget, uh, again, uh, we do have a deficit. Uh, we have discussed previously, our first meeting, we saw a bar chart that showed projections for a couple of years out. We are projecting that those deficits will continue. So we know we still have some work to do here. Uh, once we get our certified values in July, uh, we will come back and update a four-year forecast of the budget and bring that back to you all. We do expect that that will show uh, that there will continue to be budget deficits uh, absent any action from the state. Uh, they next meet in the spring. Uh, so today we don't know of any changes from through the state funding system that will impact our revenues. Uh, so, um, but we will bring that back to you all in August for consideration. On the food service fund, that is a special revenue fund. Um, our uh, revenues here are primarily from federal child lunch and breakfast programs, uh, reimbursement programs, and then also from meal prices uh, charged for students who um, are on a paid status. Uh, this fund receives no money from the general fund for operating purposes. Uh, prices for the paid lunch meals must increase by 10 cents this year uh, in order for us to comply with a requirement from uh, in the federal regs that says that the, the federal reimbursement for uh, free meals cannot be used to subsidize our costs for a paid meal. And so until you reach a point where your lunch prices uh, are equal or exceed the federal reimbursement for a free meal, then you have to continue to increase your lunch price by 10 cents. So we'll be increasing our, our lunch prices by 10 cents uh, this next year. There's no change in the breakfast meal prices uh, and no change in the reduced uh, price meal prices. Um, the percent of our kids who are eligible for free or reduced price meals is right at 70%. Uh, on the expenditure side, um, our food service employees always receive the same uh, compensation uh, uh, raises, in, in this case, health insurance contributions that uh, all other employees receive. Uh, so those have been factored into their budget. Um, the, uh, we've also built um, the expenditure budget based on what we anticipate participation will be. Uh, so similar to the way we project enrollment, uh, the Food Service Department tracks participation, and we apply that against, uh, along with our enrollment projections, to estimate what partition, participation will be. That, in turn, uh, is something that we use to determine uh, the quantities of food that we need to purchase. We also take into account uh, what we think our federal reimbursement rates are going to be. We don't have those yet, but we anticipate um, what those will be as we set the budget. Uh, so then on the fund balance piece for food service, um, they are projected to have a fund balance at the end of the 18-19 year of $19.8 million. Very healthy fund balance, right at about three months of operating expense. So here you can see um, their uh, budget, food service budget. Uh, again, uh, you see in the column Second from the right, uh, the proposed budget. Uh, we are proposing a budget that has a small surplus of $279,624. And there you see at the very bottom of the page uh, their budgeted ending fund balance of $19.8 million. The other funds that we adopt a budget for each year is the Natural Gas Fund, the Debt Service Fund, and the Construction Fund. There are no changes to these uh, budgets from what we looked at last week. There are no people charged to these funds, so there was nothing added to these costs for raises or health insurance, and we haven't made any other changes to these. In terms of the Natural Gas Fund, uh, all of those proceeds are legally committed by this board uh, for future special projects. 
Uh, we account for royalties and interest earnings um, of, associated with our, our mineral leasing activities in this fund. On debt service, uh, this is where we accumulate um, uh, uh, revenues from property taxes, from the debt service tax, uh, to pay the principal and interest that will be due uh, on our bonds in this upcoming year. So again, um, we are anticipating that property values will be up 7.14% uh, this next year. And um, we have, uh, uh, because of that growth, we are able to leave our tax rate at the same uh, rate that it was set last year and still be able to generate the dollars we need for, uh, for our principal and interest payments in this upcoming year. Uh, the, again, the tax rate uh, for the debt service fund will be set in August after we get our certified values. We built into the, um, the, the expenditures, uh, the expenditure budget, uh, the principal and interest that we anticipated paying on the bonds that uh, you all just approved uh, a, a few minutes ago. On the construction fund, uh, this is where we account for proceeds from uh, bond sales. Uh, and we use those proceeds to, um, to deliver and carry out the projects that were approved as part of the bond program. Uh, we also have funds in there in our local construction fund, uh, and likewise, those dollars are used uh, exclusively to fund uh, capital projects. So there's one column on this slide for each of those three funds, uh, summarizing at very high level again uh, the budgets for those three funds. Uh, the Natural Gas Fund um, has a a, a budgeted surplus of $910,000, which is based on our estimates of royalties and interest earnings uh, on the fund proceeds for this next year. Uh, in the debt service fund, you can see that uh, at the moment, we're, we show a, a slight um, deficit. We would be taking a little bit of money out of fund balance uh, based on this budget. However, uh, the as you heard a few minutes earlier, uh, we actually did very well with our bond sale in terms of pricing. Um, the price we actually uh, have received on our bonds, the interest rates, is less than what we used when we built this budget. And so our expenditures will be just a tick less for the, the payments due in this next year on those bonds you, you all authorized this evening. Likewise, um, it may be that our property values come in slightly higher uh, than what we use in our budget projections. Therefore, the revenue would be a tick higher. So I think at the end of the day, uh, we likely will not uh, see any, anything coming out of fund balance for, um, for the debt service fund. On the construction fund, uh, it shows the line that says operating surplus and deficit shows 248 million dollar negative number. Well, that's simply using bond dollars that we've already sold uh, for projects in the 2014 bond program. Those proceeds are already sitting in the fund balance for this fund. So it's simply a matter that we're utilizing those, those bonds that we've already sold. So we anticipate at the end of next year um, that we'll have a, an ending fund balance there of um, $922,000. And this uh, takes into account um, our expectations on contracts that will be let in this next year for the remaining uh, bond projects that, uh, that we expect to issue uh, bids for in the upcoming months. Again, in terms of the tax rate, um, we don't anticipate that we will be changing the tax rate. Uh, we won't know for certain on that debt service piece until we get our certified property values July 25th, uh, but we do anticipate that we will come back to you in August uh, to adopt uh, a tax rate that is no greater than uh, $1.36867. So with that, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Powell, and uh, as always, uh, thank you to you and, and your entire team and, and all of those uh, uh, leaders that uh, spend lots of time formulating this budget, lots of work, and I uh, really appreciate what you do year in and year out uh, and what the district does year in and year out 
in getting us to this point and, and sorting things through with us as trustees to comprehend and understand and, and keep moving this machine forward. So thank you very much. Uh, this is a discussion action item. Uh, there's uh, some lights lit. Uh, Mr. Hibbs? Turn myself off, I'm sorry. There you go. Thank you, President Rice. And I'm so glad you, you, you uh, just stated the way that you uh, what you said is that uh, for uh, Ms. Powell, for you, your staff, uh, you work so uh, diligently on this, and we know that you've been working on it for a matter of months. Uh, we we have seen it in a very abbreviated uh, amount of time, but uh, yeah, during the course of this past year, you've br you brought us many amendments to either in the 2017-2018 uh, budget, and uh, then you, at the same time, looking at uh, the 20. Uh, 18, 19, um, and uh, looking at the numbers, they're very difficult to look at at times, I know. And for that, I, I have to um, just uh, thank you and your staff so much. I mean, what, uh, uh, the, your two colleagues sitting uh, just to your left and then uh, the rest of the department, uh, you work so diligently. I truly have to say that financially uh, or fiscally, um, our district is run probably the best amongst any district in the state, and it's because of, of y'all's uh, uh, guidance and leadership. And despite this board, you do a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, and I say that in jest because I know that my uh, colleagues uh, do a tremendous job also. They, they um, are very, very acutely aware of the challenges that we have. We have some uh, huge challenges in the state as it uh, uh, deals with funding uh, for schools, um, how they even do, a, uh, you know, allocate fairly uh, for students uh, from district to district because um, our, our district doesn't recognize the same dollars that many other districts do. And because of that, that it puts us at a, um, having to find funding. Um, this budget is a difficult budget to look at. It, it's got a lot of challenges to it, and we're going to find that um, there's more difficult um, um, challenges that's going to be on the horizon. I want to applaud my um, and thank my fellow uh, board members because uh, the choices and the decisions that we had to make over the past few weeks um, were something that had to be well thought. It had to be gut wrenching in some ways because you look at numbers and uh, they're they're not always in the black that we would like to see. Uh, but we know that our teachers uh, and administrators, our auxiliary employees, um, all are facing challenges with um, uh, with uh, inflation, with cost of living. Uh, with the outrageous um, health care um, uh, increases, and we did what was right on behalf of our employees. And uh, hopefully that messaging will be able to get out uh, that, uh, that our employees uh, should feel uh, like the administration and this board has uh, done their best to answer those. Um, with those concerns. We can't alleviate them, but we can answer part of them. And um, I'm happy that we were able to work well with our teachers' organizations. And, and uh, we've heard from uh, at least two of them um, very uh, recently with um, uh, much appreciation. And with that, I move to accept the 2018-2019 proposed AISD budget. Thank you, Mr. Hibbs. Uh, there are uh, some lights, uh, Mrs. Fowler. Tell me if this is the right the right time for this question, but Ms. Powell, I wanted to ask you on the food service. Well, no? yeah, no, if you're not prepared to okay. second, then let's see if there's a second before we continue okay. on then, please. This is I'll second the motion. Okay, so there's a motion on, on the floor then from Mr. Hibbs and a second by Ms. Walton. And now we'll have some discussion. Go yep. ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Powell, on the food service fund page, 
On the part under revenues, where it says percent eligible for free or reduced price meals, 69.3%, is that number of those that are eligible or those that actually have applied and get that? Those are the ones that have applied and that have qualified for that status. And that's where the, the federal funding comes from, those numbers? Yes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Walton. Uh, thank you, President Rice. I just have one clarification. I need to be sure I'm answering a question that I've had uh, correctly. Um, last year, we added uh, some funds to adjust and make equitable some teacher salaries that had kind of dipped uh, below the curve. Uh, this year, I understand that what we did last year did a pretty good job of leveling that out um, so that these salaries are now equitable and kind of in line. It, it, am I right about that? You are absolutely right. Um, we had a situation last year where uh, teachers from with eight to 18 years experience, um, their salaries were trailing uh, a, a, just a very slight amount below the median of our comparison group, our TASB comparison group. Uh, the board made equity adjustments last year to, uh, with the hopes of closing that gap by half. The board also approved raises uh, last year, and what we said was we would come back and we would look at that again uh, to make sure that, see if, if further adjustments were needed. What we found this year is that um, pretty much everybody is above the median of our market comparison group. Uh, there was one place where we were right at just, just a hair below uh, the median uh, of our comparison group, and it's our expectation that the raises we're giving this year uh, more than take care of that. So there are no further equity adjustments that were needed to get uh, teachers in that band, uh, at least to the, the uh, market median. Thank you. I had that question, and I thought that was the answer, but I sure wanted to be sure. And thank you very much for all your diligence and all your hard work and the rest of your department, all that they've done. It's, uh, it's very helpful to be where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Welton. Mrs. Mays? Thank you, President Reich. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Powell, for the presentation uh, of the budget, and thank you to your staff for the work that you've done. My colleague said months, he's correct, but I'm sure that after we pass this in August, after everything gets certified, you'll kind of start working on next year's budget. So right about that. <laughs> thank you very much for, for your hard work. Um, I just wanted some clarification on the proposed budget for our three additional funds. For the construction fund, the ending fund balance, that $922,000, that's the money that is remaining for any additional bids or money that we want to spend for the 2014 bond. Is that correct? It is, and um, the budget, the budgeted expenditures in that fund uh, cover the projects remaining to be let. Uh, and so um, that assumes that we have uh, issued contracts on all remaining phase four and phase five projects. Now, by the time we get to next June 30th, we will still have projects underway, but we will have already issued contracts, so those dollars are encumbered. Whatever actually is not spent uh, June 30th rolls back to fund balance, and again, we just budget those funds that following year. Uh, but uh, we do expect that we will deliver all the projects in the bond program uh, within the resources we have available. Okay. So I'm understanding you to say that everything that we had intended to expend for the 2014 bond and we get our regular updates is included in the expenditure line here. Yes, well, we've already spent it in years past. Okay, so if what we want to do for the remaining of the 14 bond, if it does not exceed the $922,000 here, um, that remaining money would be, what would be done with the remaining money? Well, you can use those funds in any manner that is consistent with the language in the ballot proposition. So um, we wouldn't transfer that to the general fund. You would use that for capital projects um, that uh, fit the description of what was on the, uh, the bond 
uh, proposition, including construction, renovation, and equipping of school buildings, purchasing of school buses, and white fleet vehicles, purchases of technology, or purchases of, um, uh, of, um, of other equipment, um, and so fine arts instruments. Um, so I, I do want to caution, we have a long way to go. Uh, you know, we've had some I'm an even the last, yeah, uh, you know, in the last few days, of things that, that we know we have to be mindful of, uh, such as the new steel tariffs. Uh, or will now put pressure on construction costs that had not been there uh, before now. And so, um, yes, we, this is where we think we'll be. Um, again, I want to be very clear that we're budgeting expenditures for all the remaining projects up in that expense line item. And by June 30th, not all those will be finished. And so, uh, again, since we're going to cut a PO for them, even if we haven't finished paying off that PO, we want all those dollars budgeted or right. appropriated. So uh, we'll continue the work into that following year. Uh, the Fine Arts Center and Athletics Complex, uh, will uh, the, that construction will be complete in summer of 2020. So those should be our, our final projects that, uh, that, uh, that we'll complete. And so we still have work ongoing all the way out until summer of 2020. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and I hope our community continues to see the work that's been done from that 2014 bond that we're still working on and continue to see the good work that has come from those approved dollars. And um, based on the information that you just said, I also want to say thank you for creating a budget because I know that it's very difficult to create a budget when uh, times are so um, scary, if that's a politically correct word that I can use, um, crazy for what's happening from our legislature and otherwise. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Mays. I don't see any other lights indicating further discussion. So there is a motion uh, on the table to adopt the 2018-19 fiscal year budget as presented. Please vote. We have a budget. Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> That's not in the budget, Ms. Mays. <laughs> Moving on, uh, we uh, the next item on our agenda is items to be withdrawn from the consent agenda. Are there any items that any trustees wish to be uh, withdrawn from the consent agenda? Mr. Chapa, hold on. There you go. Uh, thank you, Pre President Reich. I'd like to withdraw consent item G, specifically and only policy CO local. Okay. So we will consider separately uh, consent item G, specifically CO local policy amendment. Any other items to be withdrawn from the consent agenda? Okay. So then we will move on to consent. And uh, we will consider the items that are under consent on the agenda. And uh, there are some bids. Ms. Powell, can you uh, uh, share any bids with us? And yes. Uh, President Rice, board members, Dr. Cavazos, there are nine bids on the consent agenda this evening for your consideration. In all cases, the administration is recommending the lowest bids, the bids that represent the best value to the district. Uh, we also have donations uh, for your consideration this evening. This is the final um, donation report for the year. And so for tonight, uh, we're presenting donations totaling $151,603. And that brings our year to date total to $2,464,160. And again, that's that will be the, the year end report. Very good, very good. Thank you so much, Mrs. Powell. Uh, so there is a... Uh, uh, consent, then, I would entertain a motion uh, to accept the consent agenda as presented uh, with uh, removing item G, specifically policy uh, CO local. And Ms. Fowler? President Rush, I move to accept the consent agenda minus item G. Specific on the policy CO yes. local. Okay. Ms. Mays? Second. 
Okay, a motion by Mrs. Fowler, second by Mrs. Mays to accept the consent, less item G, specifically policy CO local. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Consent passes unanimously. So now we will consider item G, uh, policy CO local separately. Uh, Mr. Chapa. Whoops, hold on, try again, please. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you, President Reich. I'm uh, not sure of the appropriate procedural uh, way to proceed with this, but I think it would be proper for me to move to amend policy CO local um, with the uh, proposed amendment that I have uh, typed out for my colleagues and I can read into the record if, if appropriate. Yeah, let me get to that. Make sure all trustees get to that section. That's, that's certainly one way we can do it. Okay. Yeah, if you can just point us to uh, what section and where and what the wording would be. Okay, so this would um, amend the sections currently titled meal charges, state law, federal law. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay, and this would uh, this amendment would would now be titled meal charges and financial integrity, and it would read: A student with an insufficient balance on his or her meal card or meal account shall be allowed to continue to purchase any food items provided with a full price meal. The superintendent shall develop processes for one, notifying parents about insufficient meal account balances; two, attempting to replenish insufficient meal account balances. Three, preventing the overt identification of students with insufficient meal account balances. Four, collecting unpaid debt related to insufficient meal account balances as necessary to maintain the financial integrity of the food service account. And five, identifying students who may qualify for free or reduced meal programs and assisting their families with the application process during registration. Um, that's the end of the amendment. Essentially what this would do is it would uh, remove the, the portions of the current proposed policy that deal with grace periods and alternative or courtesy meals um, and essentially keep the substance of the rest. Okay. So you're uh, reading that in the form of a motion with that amendment. Is there a second on that? We need a second to discuss, is that correct? to discuss that part? Correct. Second. Okay, second by Ms. Mays. Okay, discussion? Yeah, thank you, President Reich. Um, this is a policy that was carried over from TASB 109 update that we first received in January, and I think heard at a February meeting, and we've, um, we pulled it then, and we have been looking at it in governance committee uh, pretty much ever since, and I'd like to, uh, to thank you know, Ms. Walton, uh, Mr. Hogg, Ms. Powell, uh, Mr. Lewis and, and many others who have answered my questions over the past few months and, and put up with um, the, the many explanations of my, my position um, that I've given in governance. But what I'd like to do is, is sort of start with a, a background of where this policy came from um, that I'm trying to amend and then address the motivations for my amendment. There have been recent uh, changes in the law that require districts to formally put in policy how they treat students who have a negative meal account balance and whether or not those students are subject to a grace period of some kind and whether or not the district provides an alternative or courtesy meal. Different districts use different nomenclature for that. We have in the past had a grace period of two days. What that means is that a student who has overdrawn their meal account balance could continue to receive a, a regular meal for breakfast or lunch for up to two days, um, at which point they were provided with a alternative or courtesy meal. Now the alternative or courtesy meal that the district previously provided up until this year, up until the very end of the year, um, and based on discussions that we had, was a cheese sandwich and milk. That was one option. Another option was two vegetables and milk. Another option was a vegetable plus a roll plus milk. And so at some of our campuses, what this alternative meal became identified with was the white sack um, that students would be given if they had an ins insufficient meal account balance and tried to purchase a regular meal. Now what we found out during the course of discussing 
this policy with staff is that, uh, in fact, many students were not cut off from regular meals after two days of purchasing meals. And so at some campuses, a student might receive three meals before the alternative meal was applied. Some places it was five, some places it might be 10. Some, um, some campuses it was never applied because people felt very uncomfortable with essentially denying a kid the meal that they chose or that they desired um, with, with the alternative or courtesy meal. As we were going through the process of, of looking at this policy, we also discovered that, um, or I learned that at the end of the year, um, any unpaid balance in student meal accounts that remains cannot be paid for with food service funds. Those funds have to come from the general fund. And in prior years, um, that, that amount that was charged off at the end of the year was somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90,000, and it's jumped up this past year um, considerably. Um, there's reasons to sort of why that might have happened. We've taken efforts to not overtly identify students who have to get an alternative meal. Formerly, they were given a ticket at the register that they could take home to remind their parents. But of course, a student going through the line and getting a ticket saying, essentially, your, your parents haven't paid up, overtly identifies a student. And, and under federal guidelines, we're supposed to try to minimize the overt, overt identification of students who have overdrawn mill account balances. What my amendment proposes to do um, is change the district's approach to the grace period and alternative meal policy um, to become a district that does not have a, a grace period because we don't offer alternative or courtesy meals. And this is an approach that districts across the country have used, um, by no means all of them. Uh, many districts do employ an alternative meal approach, and, and the latest um, data that I could find today from the USDA was that at least in 2014, about 39% of districts provided an alternative meal. So there are a sizable number of districts that, that don't uh, have an alternative or courtesy meal policy. What I would like to do, though, is focus on how we have, have treated alternative and courtesy meals here um, as a result of the policy discussion that we've had. And before I go into that, I, I want to communicate my deep appreciation for the way that Dr. Cavazos, Ms. Powell, Mr. Lewis, and, and the food services staff have approached this discussion. The courtesy meal that I just described will no longer, if this policy is adopted uh, one way or the other, um, my understanding is will no longer be in the form that it was in the past. It will be substantially improved and uh, to the point where it qualifies for federal reimbursement. And specifically, it will be a cheese sandwich um, on, uh, of two ounces of cheese on whole wheat bread and then essentially the sides that would be available to a student purchasing a regular meal. So that would be the veggies, the fruit, milk, and juice. And so I think that regardless of what happens uh, to my amendment, that students going forward will have access to a much improved courtesy meal. And I am very appreciative of the administration's willingness to consider that and put that into place. And I know it comes with the cost to the district. And so I'm, I'm very cognizant of that fact and very appreciative. Um, what, I, and what, what follows is not a critique of, of how the administration has handled that at all. The reason that I would like to move to a no courtesy meal or no alternative meal option um, is that the policy that we're, that local CO that's in front of us uh, changes the grace period to at least school, at least two school days. And the reason that this was done was I think very admirable, which was to align it with the way that it's being implemented on our campuses that very few campuses, if any, were cutting students off and forcing them to get the alternative meal after two days. The problem that I have with moving it to at least school days um, was a problem, uh, an issue that I identified uh, back in February and that the, it's the policy remains arbitrary. So it was arbitrary in practice prior um, to the consideration of this policy and now we've, we've sort of baked in the arbitrariness to the policy and I don't mean arbitrary in, in, a, in a derogatory way, I mean it to simply reflect that under this policy, it's at the discretion of whoever is in charge of requiring a student to get a courtesy or alternative meal, whether what, what number of days beyond two um, they're allowed. And so on some campuses, it might be three. On some campuses, it might be five or 10. Um, it, it's hard to say. And I think that part of this is very well-meaning in, in the sense that we want to treat students as individuals. And each of them have individual family characteristics that we would want to take into account. Um, but what it also means is that um, a student um, who has no control over whether or not their parent has paid, especially elementary school students, have no control over whether or not their parent has kept their meal account balance up to date, could be treated differently depending on what campus they go to, and on some campuses that might be um, a more solicitous, more generous treatment of them 
versus others. So I think that the arbitrariness of the original um, way that we address this problem um, still remains even with this new policy. Whereas uh, eliminating the courtesy alternative meal ensures that all students would have, the ac have access to the same entrees that um, essentially, because that's what this is over at this point, is the entree provided to any other student um, and have, they will have equity of access to the same meal. I think that this still, I think eliminating the courtesy meal um, addresses a problem that remains with the overt identification of students who have to get the courtesy or alternative meal. Because if we're going to have a policy, there is it at some point uh, that, that has to be reached where it's put into effect, or otherwise there's no um, efficacy to it at all. And whenever that happens, a student who has an overdrawn meal account balance will have to get the new courtesy meal with the cheese sandwich in the sides. And going forward, should only get the cheese sandwich in the, the sides. And so, in a way, the students are still being overtly identified because even though the, the new courtesy meal will be a daily offering, um, a student whose parents keep their meal account sufficient will always now have the option to choose from three entrees. They could get the courtesy meal cheese sandwich, they could get, let's say, popcorn chicken, or they could get nachos. But a student with an overdrawn meal account balance, if the policy is actually implemented, would always be required to get the cheese sandwich. And so I think the overt identification of a student who always must get the cheese sandwich remains, and that overt identification would not only be minimized, but be, would be eliminated by not even having a courtesy meal. During our discussions, a common rationale for having a courtesy meal or alternative meal policy is that it serves as a deterrent for, um, for parents who let their kids' meal account balances lapse. And I think if we look at the numbers, I think, first of all, um, the magnitude of the problem that we're addressing is very small. And so, and I want to again thank the staff for providing me with this information. Um, and the most recent numbers are from the 2016-2017 school year. And in that year, we finished the year with 9,352 students who had an overdrawn meal account balance. However, 70% of those negative accounts were $8.10 or less, which means that they fell within the two-day grace period. And those are students that would continue to fall, assuming everything remains the same, uh, moving forward within the two-day grace period. So those are, for, so for 70% of the students who have a negative meal account balance, in essence, we are already providing them with a regular meal. So that, that leaves a, a much lower number of students um, than the students who have meal account balances that this policy would apply to. In 2016-2017, um, there were 2,217 students who were in fact served a courtesy meal. But there were only 6,757 meals, alternative meals actually served. What this means is that for students who received an alternative meal, they received on average three. So the magnitude of the problem that we're addressing, that this movement addresses, is actually, I think, very small. So the problem to be deterred is also very small. And I would also point out that the amount of the charge off at the end of the year has continued to creep up and in fact jumped this last year, even with this policy in place. And there are, um, we have had commitment from district staff to take a lot of efforts starting this next school year um, to ramp up efforts to ensure that those negative account balances don't continue to compound. And among those are, um, we're going to send notes home in students' folders because we don't want to overtly identify them at the register. We're going to more frequently resort to making phone calls home to parents who have overdrawn account balances. We've implemented a new email reminder system to parents to provide another mechanism to let them know that their child's mill account balance is overdrawn. And we have moved up the process for uh, um, pointing parents to the free and reduced meal application. We've moved that up earlier in the year. It's going to be at registration. And that's very important because what we discovered during this process is that almost one fifth of the students who ended up with a negative meal account balance at some point during the school year were transitioned to a free or reduced meal program. So I think we're making a lot of efforts that are going to reduce the amount of the charge off at the end of the year already. I'd also like to point out that 
in terms of dollars, I think that this policy gets us a lot without costing much. So if we take the 6,757 alternative meals that were provided in 2016, 2017, and we assumed that the district ate the entire cost of a high school, the average, the high school meal um, cost that is charged to our high school students, which is $2.90. My rough math, which is by no means super accurate, um, given my profession, is about $19,595. So let's find that up to $20,000. That's how much it would have cost to provide a regular meal at the high school cost to each, for in lieu of each of the alternative meals provided in 2016-17. So what does this get us? I think from a teacher or an educator standpoint, if you have a student who has a 1045 lunch, I think it ensures that those students get the entree of their choice that they've looked forward to getting um, instead of just a cheese sandwich that they're more likely to eat. So if you take a, a first grader who eats at 1045, and they don't really want the cheese sandwich, they don't get out of school till 3.35, and so by three o'clock you can imagine how those students might be acting in class. I think about it from the, the point of view of, of who the students are likely to be who would fall into the category of benefiting from this amendment. Uh, something that was brought up during our discussions is that um, many, many of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch already, and so there's sort of an assumption that well, if a student has accrued a negative meal account balance, it must mean that, that really a good chunk of them, at least, are, are people who could have afforded, this op afforded to pay for their kids' food, um, but for whatever reason, they're not. And I want to challenge that assumption because the cutoff for a reduced meal, uh, reduced meal is $46,435 for a family of four next year. So if you make less than that, you can qualify for reduced lunch, um, and at some point it kicks into free. But what that means is that many working families who struggle to make ends meet are priced out of the reduced and free meal program. And we don't really have a, a, a sense of how many of those individuals are the ones who are accruing the negative meal account balances for whom something like a car repair um, or maybe unanticipated uh, loss of their job is the reason, real reason why they have a prolonged period where they can't pay off their meal account balance and then that carries over to the end of the year. And then finally, just as a matter of, of looking at this from what is my real philosophical objection, is that we have framed this as a policy that we need to serve as a deterrent um, to preserve our finances, but also to teach kids some responsibility in some way. And I want to push back on that idea as well. I'm always leery of approaches that attempt to change the behavior of adults by using children. And if we are to, in fact, hope to use this policy as a deterrent, in order for it to be efficacious, it has to be implemented. And what we discovered during our discussions is that even under the prior policy, very few people in this district actually wanted to, and in fact did, implement this policy because no one wants to take a tray from a child that wants a different meal. And that, in fact, was not really happening, we, we discovered. But more importantly, people don't want to tell a child who comes to school hoping to get popcorn chicken that they have to have a cheese sandwich because their parents didn't pay their meal account balance. I don't think this district's heart is in that place to begin with. And I think we should align our policy to match that and I hope that that is what this amendment does. So thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chapa. I appreciate uh, uh, your words and uh, describing the, uh, the, the many steps of uh, procedure regulation that the district uh, goes through and is uh, uh, going to uh, uh, use or the examples that you stated going forward. There are a couple of uh, lights indicating some further discussion. Mrs. Mays. Thank you, President Reich. Um, thank you for your uh, amendment offer, um, Justin. I have a few questions that maybe you can answer since it's your amendment and then some questions that I may have to have staff answer for me. Um, wanted to make sure that you said any unpaid balances 
um, at the end of the year from these accounts come from our general fund and not the food service fund. Is that correct? No, no. Go ahead. That, that, that's correct. All right. uh, Mr. Lewis and, and Ms. Powell uh, made clear during our discussions that federal regulations would prevent us from using the food service account to do that. Okay. So the expenditures for making those meals came from the food service fund, but the unpaid balances are coming from the general fund. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Or fair to say, I should say. Um, okay. And then, um, is it safe to assume that the same amount of food is being made every day without a consideration of those who may have low or negative balances? I, I, I believe that's so, but I would defer to Mr. Lewis. Yes? Okay. So um, how do the schools decide how many of those alternative meals to actually make? And that exceeds my knowledge, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Lewis. The currency meals is is based on a um, uh, obviously a student with a with a negative balance. You don't know if that student with a negative balance is going to come at, at any particular time, um, and so um, the schools would uh, just by history would make some. Now, in addition to the uh, policy of the courtesy meal, there's another statement uh, in that policy is that uh, we will not take a meal that's already um, received. And so where it might seem arbitrary that the, um, the policy is being enforced, um, if a, a student actually has already taken a meal, um, we're not going to take that meal away. Um, and so it, it looks like it might be arbitrary, but um, you know, we're not going to take it. Um, and so to, to answer that uh, question, it's based on the, the history at that particular school, how many negative balances um, that, that the manager uh, notices um, that um, they may have. And so it'll be uh, different at every uh, campus. Um, but the manager uh, will know how many negative balances there are um, and make a determination on uh, how many uh, they would expect uh, to come in. Okay, so you're saying that on a some type of a repetitive time, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, based on the current um, amount of negative balances, that's how they determine how many meals yes. to make. So let's say half of those meals, which, you know, I admit I was one of those parents in elementary school that just got busy and forgot to put money in my kid's account, bring a check that day and it's no, it's no longer negative. So they've made that meal, but now my child doesn't really count anymore because now he does have money in his account. Yes. Is that a correct statement? Okay. But, uh, but uh, also with that uh, particular meal, um, the uh, the sandwich would just be wrapped up and and you know and, and placed in the refrigerator uh, for another day, and so it's uh, it's not like a, a meal wasted. Is it already grilled? It's 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 not a grilled cheese sandwich. It's just a cheese sandwich. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> that was important. <laughs> That's the difference. Okay. Um, Okay, thank you. That, that answers my questions for that. Um, so then my last questions, um, monetarily wise. So if we were to implement this program, we would no longer have the expense of making alternative meals. Um, is that correct? They, any cost that would be associated with them wouldn't, wouldn't materialize, yeah. Yes. Sit, Mrs. Powell. If we approved and Justin's amendment. Right. Uh, so uh, maybe we had you repeat the question. I want to make sure I heard it correctly. But um, you know, if if we implemented the policy as as he has proposed, uh, then it may change uh, the the type of meals we prepare. Uh, the courtesy meals cost a little bit less than the cost to prepare a regular meal, if you will. Uh, we have extensive data uh, on our food service programming that we use always to help us prepare meals in general. 
Uh, and so, uh, as Mr. Lewis described, um, you know, we, we know how many meals roughly to prepare. We try very hard to not over-prepare so we don't have food waste, and, and which drives up our cost. Uh, so there might be a little shift in, you know, the number of regular meals we uh, prepare versus um, uh, the alternative meals that we prepare, uh, but we still will incur roughly, a, you know, a, 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 there's going to be a cost uh, for that, and the regular price meals cost us more than the alternate meal does, and I'm not sure I've completely answered your question, so you may need to restate it. Okay. Um, so then the additional cost would be the difference between the preparation of the alternative meal versus a regular meal. In, in terms of actual um, meal cost, yes, or food cost, yes, mm -hmm. uh, and prep cost. Um, you know, I, I will say that um, you know, we've used the word deterrent, but we've, we, we, we know that this does help us control the number of accounts that are negative and the uh, size of those negative accounts. Uh, we know of other districts in the Metroplex, uh, we can name at least two that have, um, have implemented a policy where they, they don't uh, use a courtesy meal uh, and their costs have climbed considerably in successive years to the extent that one of those districts is looking to make extensive changes at this point uh, to try to um, uh, lessen the cost that their general fund is being hit with each year for those negative counts. Right. Okay, because that, that kind of goes with the first question I was asking of, do they prepare the regular meals daily without taking into consideration any negative balances? In other words, if you're feeding 64,000 students, are you making meals to feed 64,000 students? Or are you making meals to feed 50, assuming 20 would have alternative meals? Because you said you would probably then prepare more regular meals if we were to approve the amendment. And, and that is correct. Um, and again, our data tells us how many meals to prepare each day, and we have a good sense on average of the number of those meals that um, might need to be alternate meals versus um, regular menu type meals. Okay, and then um, that 90,000, 90, roughly 90, 95,000 of unpaid balances from year 2016, or whatever year you quoted, 16, yeah. 16 17. I'm assuming that would also be net of the amount that any PTAs or any other clubs at a school may actually cover, so that number could be larger? That, that is correct. What we write off at the end of the year is the remaining balance after all collection efforts on our parts, donations from PTA, or, or any other organization. It's what's left. Okay. Um, I think that answers my question. And Justin, as I'm listening to what you're saying, um, I am kind of thinking of it uh, from really two sides to take into account what you were presenting. Um, one, the, the dollar side, because I'm very interested, is one going to cost us more than the other? Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the, the overt identification issue that you mentioned. Um, in your amendment, you say purchase any food items provided with a full price meal. So you're saying still purchase that entire full price meal because it says any food items provided with. But you mean the actual full meal, not just whatever would come on the side of the whole entree. That's, that's correct. Whatever a student who, who didn't have a negative meal account balance could purchase, that's the intent. Okay. And potato, potato, don't know that it matters for legal reasons since we are talking about policy. Um, you say would be allowed to continue to purchase. Would we consider that term purchase if they have negative balance? We would still consider that a purchase? I, 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 and I don't know if that's a legal maybe question. Maybe receive is Just, a better, I don't know if it is either. Maybe receive would be a better word. Okay, I like that word better. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Mays. Ms. Walton? Yeah. Uh, thank you, President Raj. I, I just have a couple of, of questions, too, uh, some related to uh, what Ms. Mays was saying. And I, I've got to preface this by saying, after many, many years in elementary schools and helping small kids get through lines and whatever, our food service people at that level where they're meeting with the kids face to face are some of the kindest and big hearted people in the whole world uh, who want to do the best for kids. Um, I, uh, I believe that with all my heart. Um, Mrs. Powell, the uh, community groups like PTA and others, I know they've paid overdue balances last year. Do we know how much that that uh, was? I do not, and I don't know that we would have that information in food service because those payments would go into paid, the, you know, at a campus, and they go into individual student accounts, and so those individual those payments mm -hmm. from organizations are not reported and accumulated in food service. So where where do we line item or where do they I mean they, so the they, donation well, they the the check is is made payable to the school the school is putting those monies in individual student accounts. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea how much of that is going on? I, I do not. Okay, um, and on the cost of the alternate meal and the regular meal, what's the difference? The cost for a um, to prepare. Uh, are you talking about the, the right. sales price? Or no, the prepare. Okay, so the cost to prepare the new format of our alternate meal is a dollar thirty. Okay. okay. The average cost to prepare a lunch meal at the elementary level is a dollar fifty four, and at the secondary level, a dollar seventy six. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't know, I'm, I'm entertaining just in my brain. Maybe there's some compromise here between maybe doing something for elementary and something for secondary, but I don't know what that is just yet. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Walton, Mrs. Fowler. Thank you, President Reich. Um, two questions. If a child gets to the end of the line and they have a negative account, it's been said that the, the food is not taken from them. Well, then how do they get the cheese sandwich? Mr. Lewis, Ms. Powell, please. That would be um, that they would have recognized the, uh, the child before that and uh, would have uh, told the uh, child um, that this is what they would receive. Um, and so it, it, it takes the, the recognition um, of that um, and, and, then the, and then them actually doing that. But yeah, once they get through the line, um, it's very difficult to identify that student and, and then to stop that um, uh, purchase of that meal. So the students that are around them in the line would see that someone behind the counter would say, you can't have that, here's your cheese sandwich? Well, they, they, would have, um, they wouldn't uh, necessarily say you can't have that, but they would present them uh, with the courtesy meal. Okay. And my second question is, given on any div given day, some kids bring their lunch, sometimes moms will bring up pizza or whatever. So not knowing exactly how many meals to prepare, they prepare a certain amount, how much of, of that food is wasted? Because kids brought their lunch or mom brought pizza, the food that was already prepared. What what do they do with that, and how much of that is wasted? So that's um, that that's done every um, at at every campus, regardless whether it's a it's a courtesy meal or negative balance or, or not. Um, and so, but it's usually done on a pretty consistent basis. Uh, and so, it's just by history is how we determine how much to make. And then we also batch cook as well. And and so we're we're not preparing everything all all at once. Okay. We're going to be uh, preparing it uh, throughout the meal service and um, kind of uh, looking at how the day is uh, flowing as well as history. What is done with the leftover food? It's uh, thrown away. It's just thrown away. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fowler. Mr. Chapa. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with with um, maybe two points to sort of sharpen. Um, you know what I said before, maybe three points. 
Um, the first one on the deterrent effect, Ms. Mays, uh, you brought this up in several, uh, and I think Ms. Walton did too. Um, you know, I, I, my sense of the discussions we had is we don't have a sense of how strong a deterrent effect this has because the, the, the charge off has been going up even though this policy has been in place. And in fact, this year, even though the vast majority of the year we were under the old courtesy meal, which is not very great in my opinion, um, the, the charge off increased quite considerably. So I would question um, that it has a deterrent effect. I think it's an assumption and I, and, and I think something that shows that is that in 1617, we had 9,352 students, <clears throat> sorry, 9,352 students who at the end of the year had a negative meal account balance, but over the course of that year, there were only 2,217 alternative meals that were served. And so what that shows to me is that this, the courtesy meal alternative meal was, hard, was not used very often at all. Um, and so it's hard to say that it, it had any influence on whether or not people paid their students' delinquent meal account balance. Um, on the cost, and, and Ms. Mays, you brought up cost too, um, I think it's telling that, that to me, and this is an important fact to me, that 70% of the students who had a negative meal account balance in 2016-17 were within, the, the amount was within the grace period, the, the, the amount of meals they would receive under the grace period. So in essence, even under the old policy, what we were saying, in effect, is that it's okay that, that for 70% of students, we were already willing to provide those meals. And with the policy that's in front of us, we're saying we're willing to go even further. We're not saying two, meal, two days of meals, we're saying at least two days of meals. So if 70% of the students who had a negative meal account balance were covered even under the old policy, and were willing to go even further, it's an even smaller fraction of students that, that we could possibly be hoping to deter their parents from not paying their meal account balances. And so I think that we get that far down the road for the philosophical considerations and everything that I that I mentioned, the, the opportunity costs, administrative costs that have come up. I think that it's much worth our time to just see what happens when we do this. I think we've got a pretty reasonable basis for thinking that it'll work out okay. And if in a year or two down the road, this is not working, you know, the, the board's prerogative is policy, and we can always come back and revisit our policies. Thank you, Mr. Chapa. Mrs. Mays? Thank you, President Reich. Um, Justin, for the um, processes that you noticed that the superintendent would develop that we would include in your amendment, um, would these processes be done by current personnel, or are we looking at needing to have additional personnel costs for this? Or is that gonna be up to the superintendent? Yeah, I, I would think anything that we put into policy, it's up to the superintendent to figure out how to implement. Well, um, sorry, the, the proposed CO that, that even if my amendment doesn't pass, leaves to the superintendent the authority to develop regulations that address these five things. And all my amendment does is kind of collapse them together and I use process instead of regulation. But even the current policy would allow the superintendent to to implement these these things. Okay, so then I guess the answer is we don't know if this could include additional personnel costs or not. Is that correct to say that that would be up to the superintendent? I think so. Okay. So there could be another cost that we're not thinking about that could happen. And, and I think that, but I think that it would all, there, if, if that's the case, it could also be under the current version of CO that's been proposed. Repeat that. If there is an increase, I'm not saying it would be the equivalent, but I'm saying because the grace period would be extended under the version that I'm trying to amend. Mm -hmm. So if there's an additional cost associated with my amendment, there would be at least some of that cost to extend the current grace period that's been proposed in, in the version that's in front of us um, for CO. Okay. So, um, and then um, the last thing we were talking about, um, PTAs, um, I guess I just want to make clear that the PTAs are completely separate from the school district themselves. So for them not to have any information reported from that would make sense. Yeah. At the school levels, um, the PTAs can do that in any manner they choose. So it, it, or any group. So a PTA or any group could say, we're going to set aside in our budget 
and we're going to apply that to whatever the outstanding balance is at the school. So let's say their outstanding balance for that year is 5,000, they're gonna give 2,000, so there's still 3,000. Um, you've got other schools that say, hey, for the unpaid balances, let us do some of these processes that Justin has mentioned here, and then they may just make payment on someone's account. It's anonymous, so once again, we really don't know. So unfortunately, we won't know the impact of what PTAs or other groups are doing. The question that I just wanted to make sure was that this was net of any of those that would happen because they've happened, but this amount could actually be higher because once again, PTA, we don't know from year to year or any other group if that's gonna be able to continue to be sustained. So that was the point I was just trying to make was that that amount could go higher any given year. Um, and then, um, Justin, would you also consider in your amendment um, allowed to continue to receive a full price meal? Is, is there any reason why we need to say any food items provided? No. Okay. I, I, okay. It's just a, probably a quirk of how I wrote this out. <laughs> okay. So receive a full price meal. That way everything sounds equal. That is exactly the same thing as if I walked up there with money on my card. Okay. Okay. That's it. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Oh, hold on here. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Mays. Mr. Hogg. Thank you, President Reich. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mays and Mr. Chopper for some of these. <coughs> um, first off, let me thank staff for, uh, you know, correcting the white sack meal. I think that's a critical factor. I think that's something we all agree on. Um, that is something I think this new idea and this new fix is a very good idea. I think it's a, a good model which takes into account risk. As trustees, we have to account for risk. It's part of what we have to do. Um, so fixing the white sack meal is good. I think moving to an alternative meal that can receive the federal reimbursement that still gives full um, the other sides to a student is a very good piece. Um, also, let's be clear, we're feeding students. We're not letting students go hungry. And I think that's a critical factor from what we're talking about here. Um, we're also, as Ms. Fowler asked, we're not taking trays from students. That's something that we've all read a lot about in the paper. We're not doing those type of things. I think the way this policy is written, and, and Mr. Champa, I'm all for you making this amendment, um, I think there's lots of assumptions. And there's lots of assumptions, and there's other ways to go about assumptions and trying something new um, from a district. You know, we take lots of assumptions, the general fund, 80, 90, it's been an increase of what's happening. Ms. Mays was making some points about What's the risk of that cost of the outside group's funding? Because if you change the policy like that, that almost kind of goes away. It could be if they know there's no, the district's going to fund that. So as trustees responsible for stewardship of the dollars, I have a risk over the outside funding of what occurs. Um, the example we've talked about a lot is Garland ISD went to this, and the cost went up to almost $400,000 a year. And then they pulled it back. And I hear you, Mr. Choppa, say 39% um, alternative meals. I don't know which those districts are. Um, of what's happening and who's doing those. So I, I think we're worried. And, and Justin, if you're worried, Mr. Chop, if you're worried about who chooses who gets free meals, because I, I worry about that also, and we talked about it, um, I don't think it's what we should do, but you always can add an additional level of approval to make sure no one's being singled out and it's actual a case by case basis. I think, as Ms. Walton said, our cafeteria managers, Mr. Lewis, um, everyone in our schools, they, they want to give these kids food they want to they want to provide them that and this is one of those cases where i think it comes up is we're talking about a pretty small number of students that are getting the three meals as you stated that are going past this too um, we've changed this policy so that if a kid has a weird scenario and there's a weird case we're allowing that cafeteria manager and that principal to make the decision and say we're going to keep feeding you these meals we're going to keep feeding you these meals these scenarios here's what we know you know we're going to get this yes you may not officially qualify for free or reduced light right now but we know this is something we have to do and good good for them i like to let our teachers i like to let our our principals i like to let them make those type of decisions because they see those kids every single day and they know which ones what we're not taking into account is is the risk and, and what's the piece that stops someone that's completely abusing the system. 
And the problem with your amendment is it doesn't have anything in case. Um, I agree with all the pieces of notifying parents. We need to do more of those type of things. But what's the piece for that student and that family who's truly abusing the system? Because when someone's abusing the system, I believe it's taking dollars away from other students who truly need those dollars and what's happening. And is the risk, could it have happened in Garland where people find out you're not being charged, there's no abuse, and you say deterrent, I think deterrent's a pretty hard word. You know, it, it's, a, it's a distractor. It's a, a distractor or multiple ways to think about what we're doing and, and we're not taking into account what that deterrent could be of, okay, parents are paying faster, our kids helping their, encouraging their parents to remind them. We all are busy parents that forget things. Um, that occurs and knowing that alternative meal is that something that comes up and encourages them to to go and pay that and make those um mr top if you if doing this i think the way to do it is say staff you've made, we've all agreed you've made a good decision move into these reimbursements over the first semester <laughs> let's evaluate the system come back how many account for how many meals make some calculation of numbers could it be after the first semester we come back and say, Mr. Lewis says these numbers are there. We think it's fine. We think we can provide these meals, um, provide a full meal, then have some type of system in there to keep those that are abusing the system. Um, that's my biggest concern of where we have. And Ms. Powell, let me ask, um, or Mr. Lewis, why do we have an alternative meal? Because this is something that staff is recommending that we have this alternative meal. What's the, why do y'all think it's so important? Again, you know, we have found that this is something that helps us, A, control cost for us when we don't have um, revenue coming to pay for meal prep, and it helps us um, uh, encourage parents to pay their accounts so that we don't have growing balances, negative balances um, for, uh, for lunches, for meals. Because from your world, Ms. Powell, CFO, there's, there's a fair amount of risk you're worried about. There is, and, and we're trying to maintain something that is fiscally responsible that yet gives us latitude to, um, to feed children. Uh, we, we don't ever want a child to go hungry. That's right. And so we have uh, uh, an alternate meal policy that does allow us to feed children uh, in the, with those negative account balances. So we feel like it's a fiscally responsible policy as well. And, and, and I thank you, Ms. Powell. And, and if we want to, if the board wants to ask staff to evaluate this uh, policy that um, we have that's been presented to us, that governance committee worked on and officially submitted, um, I, would, I would encourage that. I would say, let's look at this over the first semester, evaluate this. We're going into a new thing that I think is a good proposal. I think it gives our staff, um, our cafeteria managers, our principals, um, our teachers to be able to make these recommendations. I think it's a good change where we set up two to at least two school days um, where they have on there. Ms. Powell, if someone, when someone pays their negative balance, if they've gone over two days, they pay those meals they got for free, correct? No, we absorb the cost of the, the alternate meal. Uh, they pay for the meals that are charged to them. Now, so let me go back. If, so if, if a student comes up and gets a full meal. They get a full meal, uh, right. then that is charged on their account. And so the $2, uh, I, I get two days of two lunches at two ninety. Yes. When my parents finally pay my account, I now owe $6 or yes. $5.80 on those numbers. Yes. If, then they put an additional... Thirty dollars. Right. If and if that child has gone beyond that couple of days and has now been served an alternate meal, the alternate meal does not get charged, charged to their account. To that, and, and that's and, and if students have negative imbalances, fund balances, fund balances, negative uh, account balances at the end of the year, um, do we have any kind of means to? Uh, do we block transcripts? Do we block anything no. from those students? So they automatically go in the negative and then they can you know it's kind of like if a student doesn't bring a book back we don't really it's, it's hold anything. Challenging, yes as 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 trustees we're in a district we're already eating much of those costs and and this is a old example of something happened uh years ago um you know you always worry about those abuses and this one will never one that gets out of my brain on free or reduced lunch um, the USDA requires a min-max audit of 
So you can't audit more, you can't audit less. And that's not counting all the families who are automatically qualified through food stamps, the Lone Star card, um, any other thing um, that, you're, that you automatically qualify for. We have a min-max audit of 3%. When we send out that min-max audit, and I know it's gone down in years past, but years ago, and I'll never forget this one, um, it's one of those things stuck in my brain, of those we reached out to, 50% didn't respond. Now that means they may not just respond. They may still actually qualify, but still, I would never forget that number of 50% didn't respond. Um, the free or reduced lunch thing, I wanna make sure that's there for students and families who need free or reduced lunch. That's who I want it to be there for. It's there for a reason. We encourage it, we want those students because the student cannot learn if they're not eating. We all agree with that up here. But I still can't get that number out of my head um, from an abuse standpoint. And just like any policy we write, any law that's passed, you know, think about police officers, they have tons of laws on the books. And there's certain ones that are small pieces that they can determine which ones they're going to officially give them a ticket for at that time. And I feel a little bit about this in that same way. We, we have this built up. We have this new policy that we've proposed and it gives flexibility and treats our staff to be able to make the determinations, make these type of things that go through um, on their own campus when they know they need it. And it's given them the power and the opportunity to be able to help students, but also on those cases where there is some type of abuse occurring, which let's be honest, is probably a very, very small percent on there. Um, it does give some type of deterrent um, from that one family who has said, well, we know your policy now. We're just not gonna pay anything and we're gonna take all the meals we want. I know that's a small case and I hate playing what ifs, but that's the what ifs. I worry about these assumptions that we're making on the risk uh, financial. I'll be voting no uh, to this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Hogg. Mrs. Walton. Thank you, President Reich. Um, I just have one final question. Is there the same amount of abuse of the system uh, with elementary as it is with secondary? Does anybody have a thought on that one? Or any information? It's all of my experiences with elementary, so I don't know what goes on at the high school. And, and on uh, abuse of the system, I couldn't uh, answer uh, to that. But as far as um, uh, elementary um, receiving uh, courtesy meals or negative balances occurring at uh, elementary, simply because um, there's so many more elementary students than there are, um, like our high school uh, uh, students, those, those numbers for elementary to high school uh, tend to um, be somewhat uh, consistent. But yes, at a, at a high school uh, level, you would have uh, seen more um, uh, uh, negative balances or more courtesy meals uh, at a um, high school level simply because the identification of that student, um, or I should say uh, less courtesy meals at a, at a high school because the identification of that high school student as they come into the uh, cafeteria, it's extremely difficult. Um, and so you, we tend to have more negative balances, um, uh, I guess, per student at a, at a high school. Um, but if you're looking at uh, high school compared to elementaries as a whole, um, there's just so many more um, uh, students and campuses, you know, obviously at an uh, elementary level. Um, so it's, it's hard to make that determination. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your, your question. <laughs> okay, I'm more confused than I was to start with. Um, so uh, let me see if I hear what you're saying. Um, maybe the elementary staff Cafeteria staff know those elementary kids more than they, the secondary the secondary oh, people. Do absolutely, and, absolutely, that's true, and and it's okay. um, it's a lot easier to identify a student at an at an elementary than it is at a secondary. Yes. Okay, okay. So there's um, more unpaid balances for our secondaries than their junior high and high schools than there are for our elementary or is it about the same per, per campus yes uh, i would i would say yes okay um do you have any numbers i i don't have that okay. all right thank you okay thank you miss walton um uh, Mr. Chapa, Mrs. Mays, uh, you've indicated lights. I would like to call the vote, but I do not want to discourage uh, further. If you have any additional questions that you need clarification on uh, for this, and if you do, then 
You do? Okay. Mr. Chapa, go ahead. Well, I, I um, <clears throat> maybe Ms. Mays, if you had questions, you go first, please. Thank you. And I just, because I've got questions that just spawned off of the answers that you gave Mrs. Walton, uh, Mr. Lewis. Um, so th the difference of the cost between the outstanding balances at the secondary level versus elementary level, um, is the discrepancy high or do you think it's just because the mills cost more? And I'm not sure, I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. You were saying that the the negative balances are higher at the secondary level than they are at the elementary level. And I'm saying is that difference, is it small enough or, or can you make the assumption that it's just because the meals cost more at the secondary level at, than the elementary versus it's more students? Uh, and it um, on the uh, negative balances, it's, um, uh, it costs more as, as far as, um, yes, the student cost uh, compared to, and I, and I uh, apologize, I know we were talking about food cost um, at, at, at one point, so I, I want to make sure you're not talking about food cost, but you're talking about the actual cost. The actual cost of the meal, yes. Um, uh, yes, there is a, um, uh, uh, basically a 15 cent difference uh, in that cost, and so um, there, is, there is more uh, at a secondary, simply because of the uh, cost of that meal, um, but also uh, simply because the identification of the students as they come in is also more difficult. Okay, and then my follow-up question to that is, when are those elementary students identified? Is it once they're at the register with their tray? No. So when are the elementary students identified that they've got a negative balance? The, um, the uh, managers have a negative balance uh, report. Um, and so as, if they're able to um, see the student um, when the class is walking in, um, that's when they'd be able to uh, see the student and then provide them a courtesy meal as they walk through the line. Um, as um, it, when you get to the end of the line, they already have a tray and we will not pull that tray. Okay, so that is normal, normal practice for a cafeteria manager to yes. do. Okay. Um, and then um, I also just wanted to know, so if you do breakfast and lunch, do you get a cheese sandwich for breakfast and a cheese sandwich for lunch? Uh, no, um, for, uh, for breakfast, um, we'll do a cereal and milk at breakfast. Thank you. Mr. Chapa. Yeah, I, I mainly just, and I can, I can put this in the form of a question and get, get what I would like to say um, out through a question, but I, would, I think I would just rather say it. Um, and this is mainly in response to some of the points that Mr. Hogg raised. And that is, I want to refocus, you know, Mr. Hogg's uh, 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 statements, uh, you know, I very much appreciate, uh, we are fiscal stewards of the district's resources, and, and, but we also have the interests of kids at heart. And I want to focus on the amount of money that I think, and, and, and Mr. Hawks said they're making a lot of assumptions here, but I don't think that I am. So if we take, again, 1617, about 6,700 alternative meals were, were, were provided that year. If you multiply that out by the cost of a high school meal, we are talking about less than $20,000. Less than $20,000. And think about that in proportion to the amount of the budget that we just approved. The other thing I would say is that think about that almost $20,000 and understand that even under the old courtesy meal policy that we have, 70% of the students who received, um, who, who had a negative meal account balance were within the grace period that we were already comfortable with before local CO even came up. And we are saying that we're willing to go even beyond that. So even more students who had a negative meal account balance at the end of the year are going to be covered even if my amendment doesn't pass which means that the potential exposure to the district for changing this policy is reduced even more. So at the end of the day, I think we are actually talking about, and I understand that Garland ISD had a bad experience. There are districts that have not. And I would rather err on the side of making a change that no longer uses as a tool to shore up our finances altering the conduct of adults by taking action against a child. And I want to be clear about that. The reason I use the word deterrent is because that is the word that came up during our discussion. I didn't use that as trying to find an emotionally charged word. That is the word that was used. I don't know how else also to describe a tool that is intended to be used to keep costs down other than to deter those balances from accumulating. We have problems with any system. Any system 
has a potential for abuse. We can't make our policies around the assumption that people are always going to engage in the worst case conduct and go from there. That itself is an assumption. We actually have no basis for assuming that a large proportion of the students who had negative meal account balances have parents who are abusing the system. I am sure that there are some students' parents who fall into that category, but we have no basis for assuming that it is even the majority of them. And Mr. Hogg referenced the 50% failure to respond to a free and reduced priced audit a couple of years ago. I'd point out a couple of things. First of all, the negative meal account balance um, that we have to charge off at the end of the year isn't coming from any students on free lunch. So to the extent there's any abuse in the free lunch system in this district, they're not contributing to this policy, this problem. To the extent that it is a problem of abuse with students on reduced lunch, it's reduced lunch. It's 40 cents per meal. It's a minuscule, it, it inevitably has to be a minuscule part of this problem. And to the extent that we are trying to extrapolate from a failure to respond to a free and reduced lunch audit, that there might be a large amount of abuse in this process, I don't think we have any basis for assuming that. And then I just wanted to push back on the assumption, and, and I don't mean by any means to impugn everybody in this district has the best interest of kids at heart. I understand that 100%. But as a former teacher myself, I, and I thought I made a, a large effort to get to know the 150 to 180 students who came through my door every semester when I was a 12th grade teacher. But I could not possibly hope to know all of the circumstances that were going on in their life and what might be motivating one kid to not turn in an assignment versus another kid. And I am, I am sure that there are students in this district who share the problems going on at home with um, trusted adults, including people who work in our lunchrooms at school. Um, but I imagine that there are many students who fall into the negative meal account balance um, problem um, who are not sharing their stories with staff at school and certainly not people in the lunchroom because that's just not who they are and that's not how they're constructed. Um, and so I, I don't think it's safe to assume that our students are letting um, people at school know so they are alerted to whether or not they might be a worthy person to allow to continue accumulating um, or receiving um, courtesy meals. And so I think the safest thing to do, even, and with the numbers in front of us at this point, is to um, eliminate the courtesy and alternative meal and understanding that nothing in my amendment, nothing in my amendment in any way alters any of the efforts that this district currently makes to recover those balances. Notes will still go home. Social workers will still visit with students and parents to the extent they can. Phone calls will go home. Um, we're gonna work with different groups to, to capitalize on these angel funds. And we're trying to get free and reduced lunch applications completed earlier, among many other things. The only thing that this amendment does is remove the tool of giving a child a cheese sandwich in lieu of the entree of their choice. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chapa. So there is uh, a motion uh, to amend the policy as, as uh, recommended by uh, committee and uh, staff uh, for what was previously read. If uh, that will be the policy as stands, if this uh, vote uh, carries uh, Affirmative. If it does not, then this is a pulled consent item, and uh, at that point, I would be entertaining a motion to willing to entertain a motion to approve the policy as originally uh, recommended, uh, or some other form. So please vote. Does everybody understand? So we have a policy with amended language that Justin has proposed, Mr. Chapa has proposed. That is what we are currently voting on. If that carries, that is the policy. If that does not carry, then uh, we would essentially revert back to what was uh, our policy recommendation from the original recommendation that was in our consent packet. Well, we to add in what Justin said. To substitute what he added and what he removed. Yes. No. But wait. Um, I think there, uh, there's confusion. Uh, Ms. Fowler, 
uh, the what we're looking at and solely looking right now would be um, Mr. Chapa's um, motion to amend the current policy. Okay, so if that's voted and approved, as uh, President Rice said, then that would become policy. But the um, committee brought us the current policy that we would take up after this vote if it was vote if if Mr. Chapa's um, amendment was voted down. So it would be two separate things. So right now, the only thing we're talking about would be Mr. Chapa's amended policy Language. change. All right. Please vote. Change allowed to continue to this oh yes day. yes all. yes everything that you had recommended okay so that amendment passes or that policy passes as as amended by mr. Chapa okay that uh, moves us on to the next section which is <clears throat> say there's no discussion items so then we move to uh, open forum for non-agenda items I don't see cards so I think uh, we will move on to the superintendent's report thank you president rice and I, I'd like to uh, just share a, a brief report uh, I'd like to uh, again, thank uh, Dan Dipert and his family for a generous donation of $135,000 to fund a piano that will be located at the ASD Fine Arts Center, which is scheduled to open in 2020. Uh, our Steinway Spirio Model B Grand Piano will be located in the pre-function space of the Fine Arts Center, Steinways and Sons, as the world's finest high-resolution player piano. Uh, the generosity of, of uh, Dan Dipert and his family uh, is to be commended, and this is an opportunity for our students to uh, have the very best. In fact, uh, our district is the first in the country to order a Spirio Model B Grand Piano uh, for our facility. And, and so you saw, you see in some of those pictures, we had some students in, in that uh, event as well, and, and Dan uh, signing off on, on what will be uh, the, the piano that he has uh, generously donated the funds for. So I thank him. Uh, for that and thank his family and with that that concludes my report and a wonderful thing indeed dr cavazos thank you very much for uh, uh, that report and to the diaper family for their amazing care compassion and dedication generosity are there any uh, school board trustees that have reports mrs mays please thank you president rice um, I just want to tell everybody to have a wonderful summer because uh, we will not be behind the podiums for the next month. So I hope y'all enjoy. Um, and I also want to say um, good luck to uh, Bowie High School, Lamar High School, and Arlington High School at the 7-on-7 seven -seven football tournament in College Station on June the 28th. Excellent. Great. Great announcement. I don't see any other trustees. Uh, indicating reports. Madam Secretary, do you have any items to consider? Go ahead. No, President Reich. Very good. So it is 9.33 p.m. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>